partner, Aero Electronics. Uh, my name is Joan Lee, and I manage partnerships, marketing, and Indiegogo. Uh, Indiegogo teamed up with Aero to offer the Aero certification, which give, uh, Aero certification program, which gives entrepreneurs like you the necessary tools and services to bring your product ideas to life. Before we begin, uh, just a few notes. This webinar is being recorded, and we will send out the replay in an email by tomorrow. If you have difficulty with the audio, try restarting your browser. And finally, we will have a Q&A session. So please save your questions for the end, and we will have time to answer them. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce you to Keaton Anderson, Manager of Engineering Tools at Aero Electronics. Keaton will show you fundamentals of, fundamentals of what you need to know to get started on building your prototype. Some of you uh, who may have attended our hardware startup boot camp in San Francisco last month might have had the pleasure of meeting with Keaton in person. And with that, I will turn it over to Keaton. Thanks, Joan. Appreciate everyone joining today. Looking forward to getting to kind of go through some of the content we're covering for prototyping. Um, as Joan has mentioned, I would not necessarily, I wouldn't be very good at being a Twitch streamer because I can't keep up with chat as well, but we're going to be recording all of these questions. Um, we have Arrow people in the chat room who will be answering some of them as we go along. Um, and then if your question doesn't get answered, we'll have a QA and a at the end. So uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go and just kind of let me know um, what you might want to know about this. So I'm going to just kind of kick it off and talk a little bit about it. So Jonah just uh, mentioned the Arrow certification program. Um, so this is a partnership between Arrow and Indiegogo. And what we're really trying to do here is help entrepreneurs go from kind of a basic idea um, that they may not have any idea of how they want to go about building it and go all the way through to the production process. And what we've seen is hardware and software can be hard, uh, but the goal is not to have it be that challenging. We want to try to be have helpers along the way to make sure that you're getting your product uh, to fruition. Some of the things that we've seen from the Arrow and Indiegogo uh, partnership is that the program has had about uh, just over 9,000 entrepreneurs who have joined. Um, and those who have joined, um, they raise 84% more funds than those who have not joined the program. And they're 4.5 times more uh, likely to reach their goal uh, if they are part of the program at their launch. Uh, one of the other things that we'll kind of cover here, and I'll go through it in the next slide, is we've also given away $1.4 million in flash funding. And that's our, one of our ways that we like to help the entrepreneur community kind of get going um, and support some of the projects that are out there uh, that look like they're going to have a, a great amount of success. We're really excited about that. So kind of go through some of the benefits of the Aero, certified per, uh, Aero Certification Program. So if your campaign actually gets Aero Certified, you're going to have a couple of things that happen. So you're going to be able to get $1,000 off components on Aero.com. Um, you're going to have some extra social media features that we'll kind of be able to go through. I'll skip through the middle one for a second so we can go through the rest. Um, we'll be able to continue to support you with manufacturing, be it through supply chain and logistics. And you'll have Aero en engineers who you're working with along the way. And then you're also going to get that campaign badge uh, that goes on your campaign. And what we've seen is that ends up bringing a lot of brand recognition. People at this point in time kind of know what we're doing with it. Uh, and your backers will then know that your product is certified and that we've been working with you so that they can kind of verify that the, uh, the content that's going into your product is legitimate and will be easily sourced. So to go back to the middle one real quick, so flash funding, this is one of the ones that we get a lot of questions on. People are very excited about. Um, so flash funding is one of the ways that we will go through. Uh, we gave away, or we've given away uh, $1.4 million so far, and we'll be continuing to do giveaways as we go along. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so as we kind of do it, it's exciting. It's something that we're really looking forward to, uh, being able to continue to work with our startups and be able to sponsor their projects. Um, so definitely we'll be able to kind of go through a little bit more of it, but there's a couple of uh, criteria regarding flash funding in terms of how you get eligible. The big one being that you want to make sure that your campaign is getting Aero certified. So we'll make sure that uh, we're moving with you uh, to certify the technology within there. So if you have any questions about that, definitely opt into the program. We can work with you to kind of go through what requirements are for flash funding. All right, with that, I am going to kick off my prototyping portion of my webinar. So. Uh, what I really want to go through here is just a high-level overview of everything that it kind of takes to do a prototype. And then I'll be able to answer more specific questions that you might have, but I want to kind of make sure that I'm going for the wide audience about all the different things that are required to build a prototype. So one of the things that we've seen with this in terms of why you would, might want to build it, it, people will kind of say, okay, like, where exactly, I'm going to have this good idea, I'm going to go to Indiegogo, I want to get funded. 
And what we've seen with this is this is really the big step in one of the ways that backers can see this is how far I've moved along with the product. So um, people that end up having these uh, are going to, so it's going to help you move along in the stages toward, as you're going through your uh, Indiegogo campaign. And then it's also going to be something that it's a physical representation. So people really like things that they can see, that they can feel, and they can see pictures of. And as you're moving along, they can see every single step along the way of how your product actually comes to uh, fruition, how they can actually see the full product come to life, which is really fun from that end. Um, people like to kind of see each little step and they've contributed into it. Uh, and as they're going through the process, they can see their product really come to life and they start to feel more invested in that. Uh, one of the other things that we've seen is that campaigns that have prototypes at launch, they raise 186% more than campaigns that don't. Um, and I think from a lot of people, this is just a, I can see it and I know I'm going to be able to buy it. It's almost like I'm getting it right off the shelf. So it's really exciting for back to are coming in to be able to see that they have the prototype right there. And backers aren't really the only ones who are going to want to see the prototypes. So if you don't have one available when you go to kick off your uh, campaign, what you might find is that you're going to miss out on some of your marketing opportunities. So this is a really good chance that if you have a really exciting product and you have a really good visually looking product, which is one of the stages we'll talk about, then essentially people who are in the media might be able to pick this up and say, look at this brand new thing. This is exciting. This is new technology, especially if you're doing anything in the IoT space. You're going to really be kind of on the cutting edge of what a lot of people are looking for. And you might be able to pick up some of your user base early on based on some of the media opportunities that are afforded you. Um, and then essentially the other portion of that too is if people kind of are able to see it, they're going to be able to then potentially try it out for themselves. If you have beta users, that kind of thing, it helps you long term in terms of ensuring the viability of your product and making sure that it, when it hits shelves, it's actually going to be the best version that it can be uh, of the product being launched. So what are some things you should consider when you're building a prototype? So this is kind of the section I kind of go through and say, like, how much engineering resources do you have? How complex is your design? Uh, do you have design and layouts? If all of these look kind of like I've never heard any of these before, um, it might be something that you're going to want to kind of go through and review some of the items here. So for example, um, for the designs and layouts, if you have those, you're probably going to be further along than some of the people who are just starting with just a high level architecture idea. I have a phone I want to build. I'm not 100% sure all that's going to go into it, but I have a couple of ideas for products. The further along you are in that, the less time it's going to require to actually get to being uh, a prototype. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if your prototyping stage is going to take really more than three months, then you might need to consider that you could be looking at outsourcing your design to an engineering group, uh, or you could also be looking at hiring and staffing additional resources to cover it. You really want to make sure that when you're launching your campaign, you have your prototypes as close to ready to go, because there's potential for design cycles to slip and grow longer than you might normally have, and that potentially makes challenges for you as you go along. Uh, and being able to hit your target dates. And when you're setting that calendar, you really want to make sure that your backers are able to see you kind of hit the goals that you're going to want to meet so that when those productions are happening, you're able to ship on time and people are feeling confident in your campaign. All right, I'm going to go into the basic st stages of prototypes. These are kind of just what we've defined as an outline. And these, again, are just high level for you to be able to see what options you'll have for these. Uh, but it's a good way for you to be able to gauge how far along in the process that you are and what other options you might need to consider as you move along. So the first one we're going to look at is a visual prototype. So a visual prototype is important as you need to think when you're getting ready to start your product, how big is this going to be? What is this going to be shaped like? Am I going to go for all curves? Am I going to have it have edges, that kind of thing? Um, why this is important is when you go to make that design and those boards, the bigger your product is, the less constraining you're going to have from an electronics perspective. This also works from a mechanics perspective in terms of how many gears and motors and what you're able to fit into the product. But you really want to think kind of coming in, you should have been drafting up a sketch. What is this going to look like? Is it going to be something that I have? Um, it's going to be palm size. It's going to be table size, that kind of thing. And the more that you have information available for that, when you go to design your product, it will help you along the way in terms of making the design decisions about whether or not you're going to need to go with smaller components, potentially solder mount, um, surface mount components, or you can potentially work with through hole to start and launch with a product in that space. So it's a good one to consider just how much space your product's going to be taking up as you're going along. 
um, from a proof of concepts page. So this is going to be what we've seen a lot of our campaigners are coming through. They're using products like Raspberry Pi or Arduino. This is your first run to ensure does all the functionality that I want to include in this product going to make it to market. Uh, this is a really important step because this is really where you're kind of ironing out, can I do all the things that I want to do with my product? So I have one on my desk right now that I just made recently, and that product looks a lot like there's wires everywhere, there's all sorts of pins soldered together. But what's important was I was able to kind of get to the, the proof of board that I wanted to have, and I said, okay, this idea could actually work, and I could actually do something with this product if I went forward. This is, again, a really important stage. It's not going to look pretty. It's not going to be anything that people are probably going to be like, ooh and ah, that kind of thing. But it's definitely an important stage because this is probably where most of your design work is going to be done. And then you'll end up doing a lot of your um, actually physical layouts and parts selection, stuff like that, following this one. Moving into that, um, we'll talk a little bit about a presentation prototype. So when we're looking at this, this is the you've done a proof of concept and you have a good idea about what you want the product to look visually, now you're going to combine the two of those and start to make it look like a nice product. So when you're taking this, this is a good chance for you to take it in front of backers or investors, and they really want to see what the product's going to look like. So this is the time that if you had something where you 3D printed like a square box to go around your product, and it doesn't look as good, you probably want to start to smooth some of those edges out. You're going to want to have it be able to really kind of hit the form factor that you're looking for. And you're going to want to ensure that long term, this is really where you want it to look visually. At this point in time, you're really starting to get uh, most of the details worked through. And you want to make sure that uh, if you have any challenges in this process, that you're kind of ironing them out before you hit mass production, because there's not much time to change once you kind of solidify that and put it into production. Um, to that point, one of the other things you probably want to look at here is a factory sample. So these are going to be this first article, these first lines off of your production path. And they're really going to be able to show you what this is going to look like in a mass production environment. So it ensures that your boards are coming out as you would expect them to be. If you have mechanicals, if the injection molding, everything that you would expect it to be is coming out um, essentially to the quality that you would want it to be. And this is the last thing you're going to have before you're shipping all of these different products out the door. So at this point in time, this is making sure that everything is going to run smoothly. It's hitting the time process that you would expect it to. Uh, and then you can kind of be able to scale your product from here. OK, so let's talk about what are the different ways that we're going to get engaged with prototypes. So I made this slide as an attempt to try to cover a broad market of applications here. So I recognize that not everyone here is probably going to be hardware design or have a hardware campaign. And what I wanted to do is kind of go through potentially a wide variety that you could look at here. So on the top there, that's going to be electronics. This is a lot around what I focus on on a day-to-day -day basis. But then I also tried to include some examples from website design, mechanical, different aspects of what we work with for different companies. So the initial design is going to be this first phase where you're just kind of sketching it out. This is your back of a napkin. This is your first kind of pass through it. So in, in electronics, this is going to be schematics. This is really, you've done your proof of concept. You've kind of wired it all up. This is that first time that you sit down and you start to draw the wires and say, this is going to connect to this, this is going to connect to that. You have no idea how big this is going to look just yet. You may have no idea um, what the actual final shape is going to be. But you're just starting to say, functionality-wise, this is how I'm expecting this to kind of come through. Uh, similarly, in both website design and in mechanical, so in website design, I kind of put wireframes here. This is going to be one of those items where you're kind of just roughly sketching out what your website might look like or your page uh, essentially associated with it. And then you're going to need to still make connection points. You're still going to need to work through uh, what is it you're going to want to pretty it up. There's probably no colors potentially on this. I've seen quite a few where it's just I click buttons and they go through like a PowerPoint presentation explaining to me how the functionality would work. And then similarly with mechanical, this is your first kind of pass at I'm sketching this through. I have a rough idea about I want to make a ball or something like that. Um, and I'm kind of going through the rough shape that I would expect for the item to be. Your secondary design then is going to start to get a little bit more ingrained in terms of where you would expect your product to go. So for electronics, this is typically what is your board layout. Uh, what board layout looks like is it's the physical description of how big your board is going to be in three-dimensional space. And why this is important is if I said, hey, I'm going to build a new smartphone and my smartphone's the size of my dinner table, it's probably not going to sell that well. Who knows? Maybe people love the giant screen. 
But the whole point of this being is that you want to know how big your board's going to be, and you want to know that will it fit inside the enclosure that I'm expecting it to, and do I have components that I can source associated with that board. Um, similarly with this, you're going to see kind of mock-ups um, or for, for website design, this is kind of where you're going to see that first representation of the color kind of comes through. It probably is something where you've been able to click through a few items and see what that actual flow is going to look like. Um, and then for mechanical, this is where we're really doing our first three-dimensional CAD model. So this is where you're going to be going into different softwares associated with it, trying to make sure that everything is going to fit essentially where you need it to be, or if it's mechanics and you need kind of motors and stuff, making sure all the connection points will turn associated with it, um, that your gear ratios are appropriate for it. Uh, the last stage we have here is your testing and quality phase. This is really one of the biggest areas that you should spend time here to ensure that your product is going to be exactly where it needs to go. So for electronics, this is going to be your first run of a prototype board. So typically, based on the company size, this can be anywhere between one to a hundred items. Um, and what this is, is it's a kind of a quick turn, you get it in a couple of weeks, and you go through and you ensure that all the functionality that you were expecting works. So if it's something where you turn on an LED by pushing a switch, you're going to press the button and ensure that does. Um, obviously, hopefully your board will have a lot more to it, but it's making sure that when you hand this to a user, that everything that you had expected your product to do is going to be working. You really do not want to have these as field failures. Once you've sent them out to customers, it's really hard to build your brand back up after something like that happens. Um, similarly, what we'll see with this for a website design is this is your QA environment. So before we push anything live on the website, we're going to drop it in and make sure that we're testing every single path, that nothing is going to break. There's not going to be any 404s. You're not going to have anything that's going to cause the user to go, this looks incomplete, or this isn't done. I want to make sure that everything looks smooth and seamless. Um, and then for 3D printing, this is actually one of the cool spaces that, excuse me, for mechanical, this is one of the spaces you can do 3D printing. So. It's really fun at that point because there are ways to kind of get that first view of what this product will be. Um, with some of those, you're maybe not going to get as much of the smooth edges like we had talked about. Um, if there's metal or something like that, it may not come out exactly to the expect that you would want. But this is really that area that you should ensure, hey, if I printed this out, does it look like I would expect it to? And do I need to make any changes before we go towards production? So I'm going to go ahead and cover the basic steps that I had just mentioned for electronics in a little bit more detail. But if there's any questions about the other ones, we can definitely kind of answer those as we go on later. So schematics are going to be the first one. So these are typically done in CAD software, so CAD being computer-aided design. And what schematics are essentially doing is I make sure that every component that needs to be on my bill of materials is sourced there. So this is the list of parts that I need to do to actually build my board. And what's important with this is you can utilize things like reference designs to be able to access some of uh, what other people have done to build in functionality to your board. So if you've never done board design before, or even if you are have done plenty, but you have an old design, what is interesting to do here is if you need just a small bit of functionality, you can take a reference design, say, for just a Bluetooth chip. So I just want to add Bluetooth to my product. I can go and find the reference design and pull that into my schematic. And so long as I'm making the connections associated with it appropriately, that product should work. And that's one of the interesting things is you may not have to be an expert at hardware design to be able to leverage some of what has already been done and try to get your product to a more cheaper and consolidated state through something like that. So definitely utilize CAD software to be able to help you build your schematics and definitely ensure that when you're kind of going through this step, if you want to add any additional functionality, uh, this is a good place to be able to make sure that you got all the blocks that you needed in there. Also, if you just need to launch with a more basic product, you can build out your schematic first and then add a reference block for something that you might need later. Um, so it's a good place to kind of work through all the designs that you might want to be adding into this. The next portion um, is the board layout phase. So in the board layout phase, this is going to be where you're looking at it in three dimensions. This is a really important phase, and we've really, to, to be honest with you, we just had a customer that came through that um, has struggled in this phase, has had a lot of challenges in this phase. It is really important to get this one right, because if the boards are not laid out appropriately, you're going to really struggle to be able to get your product to do exactly what you need it to, and it may not route appropriately. You may get your first prototypes, and they don't even work. Um, but this is a good one to be able to take if you found that reference design. A lot of times they have layout files associated with them, which essentially says if you use this schematic and this layout, it will build a board that we know works 
and it does this exact functionality, which could be huge for you if you've never done it before. You may be able to take an off-the-shelf reference design for a product that you've just proof of concept and actually get that all the way to a working board that has a lot of the cost stripped out of it. It's going to be your IP so you can own it and then you can make modifications as you go. Um, CAD is another important thing within the layout portion of the design because of the fact that it enables you to do things like design rule checks and layout checks to ensure that the uh, components are sitting appropriately on the board and that you're not breaking any rules that are going to cause you to have potentially EMI or the parts are not even going to fit or wires or all sorts of things that can go wrong in this space. Uh, there are plenty of options here. Definitely be using CAD software everywhere that you can when you're doing layout and schematics. And then this is a good place to kind of talk about the bill of materials. So while you're building out your schematic and as you're doing your layout, you're going to want to be finalizing a part selection associated with what it is that's going to go into your product. Um, I will go through this a little bit more in another slide, but I cannot stress enough how, how much and how important maintaining an accurate and up-to-date bill of materials is. It will sink you a ton over if you do not have an accurate bomb. There's a couple of different things, especially in the market right now. There's a, a global shortage on capacitors, things like that. If you're not keeping it up to date and making sure that your parts are in stock, when you go to build full time, you may not even have the components you need and you're going to be set back months as you're trying to rebuild that product. So I, I'll go through a little bit more of that falls, I think, here in a bit. Uh, but just I cannot say it enough, we have a bill of materials tool on arrow.com. I highly recommend if you've never used one to go through, add some components in there, get used to the feel, and make sure that it's keeping it as up to date as possible. Uh, there it is. All right, cool. We'll go through this right now then. Uh, so for having an accurate bomb, um, this is so important from a pricing perspective, from a lead time perspective. Uh, in this customer I was just talking about, we sourced the components and they had some that just were out of stock. Thankfully, we were able to find a cross-reference associated with it. But when you're building your bomb, it is super important that if you have components that are critical to your design, you are second sourcing them wherever you can. So if you have someone that you're buying them through, make sure they have a second source option. Make sure that you can find a lot of stock globally. This is one of those things that the Aero Certification Program helps with so much. We will go through, we'll review your bill of materials, we'll ensure that everything on there has stocking, we'll ensure that it's in life cycle so it's not getting ready to go end of life and you won't be able to find the product. Uh, we'll also make sure that we're doing kind of a high level DFM for you so that if your products will kind of go through and review the packages and ensure they're kind of in the best place that they could be. And if there's any updates to the products, we'll let you know, or if there's any products that could potentially be better for you, um, it's another place that we can say, hey, before you launch this, let's make sure you got the best components in there so you don't have to redo this design in six weeks or something like that. Uh, you really don't want to run into those delays as you're going along. And then what does a prototype cost? So really this is going to be, um, Kind of going through this, we kind of talked a little bit about this with a cutting down on your bill of materials and going to be talking about it. The prototype as a whole is typically a more expensive product. So when you're doing that first iteration of the proof of concept, I mean, there's wires everywhere. That thing doesn't even have PCB boards. There's a ton of things associated with it that's going to drive up the cost. However, this is such a mandatory phase because you really don't want to try to launch into mass production having never done a prototype run. So just know that when you get ready to launch your prototype, that product is probably a little bit more expensive than you're expecting it to be. Uh, but that's okay because you're going to be able to strip out a lot of the extra connectors and stuff like that that you're maybe not using off your reference design as you go along. Um, and that will then again eventually get you to the board where it's at its absolute minimal state and you're happy and know that you can deliver to the price point that you want to for your backers. All right, let's talk about kind of going through putting it all together. What does it look like? So for making a physical prototype, a couple of things. You're going to want to make sure that your schematic is complete. You're going to want to make sure that your bomb is vetted. Both of those Aero Certification Program can help, if I haven't mentioned that before. Um, this is a good place, too, to make sure that when you're getting ready to move forward for um, your board layout, that everything that you've done from a component selection perspective is ready so that you can get a really good idea of how big that's going to need to be. There's some components that only come in certain packages and some CMs that can only work with certain um, variations of those components. So some of them can only handle surface mount. Some of them can do through hole. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about that is if you choose a lot of through hole components, it potentially makes it significantly more difficult to mount those as time goes on. 
Um, so it's something to kind of keep in mind as you're doing component selection. That'll be something that we would look out for that could potentially cause you delays or slow down your manufacturing process as a whole. Um, and then when you're kind of ready to go past that point, this is the time to be able to contact the contract manufacturer. So there's a couple of different options. Um, Arrow can help you with this process as well. And this is that first step to say, okay, I'm getting ready to go big. You know, so you have CM, so we'll turn quick turn boards. So we'll be able to go through and do uh, a few kind of boards at a time. And then you have the ones who their specialty is really doing large amount of units in a short amount of time. And you're gonna wanna make sure that when you hit this point, you have a good CM. Um, I would highly recommend that if you can get someone local to you, it's a benefit because you can drive out to go see them instead of having to go overseas to somewhere like China to be able to get a CM. Um, there's a lot of really good partners and the price of manufacturing has really gone down within the domestic region um, in recent years. But it's definitely something that if you have that option, it's a good thing to do. If you want to just go to China, there are definitely partners that you can work that way. It sometimes will drive the cost down for you a little bit, um, but it's something to just to kind of keep in mind. I would highly recommend if it's a first run for you, making a partnership with a local CM, getting in touch with them, getting used to going to the factory, being able to see those parts. Um, it's going to help you in the long run, just knowing those people, they do it every single day, they build boards. Uh, so it's one of the best ways that you can kind of get involved. All right. So I'll go through this kind of one more time. Just want to talk about it. everything that I kind of outlined from a prototyping perspective. Um, hardware can be challenging in many ways. Software can be challenging in many ways, and it doesn't have to be as hard. Um, one of the things that we always recommend to entrepreneurs is don't reinvent the wheel. If there are areas where you're not strong, if there are areas where you're not sure, reach out for help. And one of the ways that we want to try to be a part of this is through the Aero Certification Program. If you have questions about your boards, in terms of what components should I be using? If you have questions about where should I be trying to find resources for this? Arrow is really great at this. This is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we're always excited to talk to you about your product and really excited about see what's gonna be the next thing to launch on Indiegogo. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back. Hey, Keaton, I think uh, we lost your audio there for a second. Back over to Joan. I'm back, Are you hear me again? We can hear you. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much, Keaton. And now I'm really happy to get into the Q&A portion um, of our webinar. So um, I actually saw some of the uh, some of our uh, webinar visitors today have actually been answering each other's questions, which is great. So uh, one of the biggest questions I saw, you know, I'm concerned about IP. Is it possible to have an NDA signed with your Indiegogo uh, page? So I'll answer that from the Indiegogo side and hand it over to Keaton. From the Indiegogo side, um, yes, absolutely. Your property, your ideas, everything, it remains uh, your property. Um, and for anyone who submits to the air certification program, Keaton, can you answer that? Yeah, so when you go to apply for the Aero certification program, one of the forms that you're going to have available to you immediately is an option to fill out an NDA. Um, and we'll essentially be able to go through that process with you immediately. Our certification rep uh, will contact you after you apply for the program. And that's one case where we can go through and ensure that the NDA has been signed. And before you have any conversations with our engineers or any of the technical folks, we'll make sure that at a high level you're being uh, very assured that your product is being covered from a non-disclosure perspective. Great. Um, Frank asks, is there any free mechanical design software for 3D printing without any limitation of commercial usage? Free without limitation? Well, so there's always going to be a challenge behind that. I mean, the companies that build CAD software are going to be looking to put some limitations in there to ensure that uh, you're able to go through uh, and they want to kind of be able to get subscriptions or something like that. Um, one of the ones, so a couple of softwares to think about, um, Onshape is one that we've worked with in the past that has an option for a free from a viewer perspective. Um, there are companies like SolidWorks and like um, DesignSpark uh, Mechanical that have options for you. Those are a couple that I would look at. Um, you will eventually be able to kind of come to your own preferred platform. A lot of these are something where after you've taken the time to review it for a bit and kind of learn it, you kind of get really stuck and you're like, I really enjoy this one. This is the one I prefer. So I'd recommend that if you haven't selected a CAD tool, try a few of them out. A lot of them have good free trials and demos, um, but those are the couple of the partners I would recommend. Awesome. Um, so another question. I have mechanical and electronic elect slash electrical inventions. Can Arrow verify mechanical inventions as well as electronic to allow minimal disclosure? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, on my staff, I actually have a couple of MEs associated with the what we support as well. Um, so they'll go through and be able to do some of the mechanical design review for you uh, for it. This is going to be just very high level. We can't necessarily get into all the details regarding it. Um, it's project by project basis. But it's something that if you do have mechanical aspects to your products, we are not turning those away. We'd be happy to take a look over them and then provide feedback where we can. Great. Um, will this process work if your idea is a software pro product, such as an app? Yeah, so uh, we've actually had quite a few apps come through the program. They've gotten certified. Uh, we do have that as well. It's a little bit of a tweaked process associated with what we do for the Aero certification program, but it's not going to be any different from your end. You'll be reached out to by our certification rep after you apply for the program. And we'll talk more around the particulars of how we do that review. But if it's something that you have a software app and it's just software, we definitely accept those campaigns. We're happy to be able to help out. Um, it's something I would still recommend going through and applying for the program. It's a great way for us to be able to get in touch and kind of see what particulars you're working on and maybe some of the areas that you haven't thought about that you might want to add some additional features. Great. Um, so another question about uh, contract manufacturers. So does Arrow uh, and Indiegogo have a list of trusted contract manufacturers? It's difficult to find a reliable one out there. Yeah, we, we've seen that as well. Um, so we do have a list. It's not something that it's, it's public facing. It's something that we would typically recommend that you work with an Arrow employee. We have different contract manufacturers that we work with based on your region. Um, so it'd be something that we'd probably need to talk more around the particulars for it, but it is something that Arrow does have partners we work with on that front. And if it's something that your product's at a point where you're ready to start moving towards a contract manufacturer, we'd absolutely love to help you out, um, be able to get you connected with people associated with it and help you out if you need to look at a DFM review or something like that before you move to the build state. Got it. And then another one of the very popular questions, uh, does the Aero Certified uh, Technology Program have any cost? So um, I'm not going to answer that, but uh, there is no cost to join the program. Um, nothing at all. It's uh, There's no cost in getting that, uh, if you're able to achieve Aero Certification, getting that badge onto your campaign page. Uh, flash funding opportunities, as Keaton discussed before, um, are also free. Um, uh, really, and there's no obligation to buy anything. Uh, you do get benefits such as discounts off of components if you achieve Aero Certified Technology. Um, uh, but really, there is no cost to join the program. Keaton, was there anything else? Yeah, and just, yeah, just to add to that, um, from this, from a partnership perspective and from what we're trying to do, our goal is to really help entrepreneurs get off the ground. So we recognize, um, even within Arrow, with us being a large company, some of our biggest customers didn't even exist five years ago. And so the next big thing is going to really come from the space of entrepreneurs who have new product ideas, who are bringing new things to market. So the goal of this program in many ways is not to be a, a bog to you as you're getting started up. Um, from a cost perspective, we want to support you along the way and really help see you be a success. We obviously are more successful if you're more successful. And the goal here is just really one, make sure you get off the ground. Great. Um, a question from Alice. Uh, it's a question about using parts from China. Uh, that may be, you know, what is your opinion if, uh, if the entrepreneur uses parts from China, which could be smaller and cheaper, such as an AC-DC converter module, as an example? You want to talk about just general supply chain uh, using parts from China, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, China is actually a really fascinating case study for us at the moment. So uh, a couple of things to consider in China. China is a little bit more tough to verify the sourcing of your components. Um, unfortunately, it's an area that there's potential for a high amount of counterfeiting associated with components. So we, one of the things that is nice about Arrow is we verify where all of our product comes from. You know that your product's not going to have a failure based on was it made by someone else. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is there it has been a tariff announced against parts that are from China in terms of being um, imported from there. So when you're keeping that in mind for your product, it may not be as cheap as you think. There may have been kind of some uh, tariffs associated with those products. So definitely keep that in mind when you're looking for components. I would recommend that if you have options to be able to find a cost competitive part that you can know and verify, I would go with that because really the last thing you want is to get all your products made and to find that something just doesn't work because it was sourced or it was an appropriate part um, for that. So it's something that you can definitely use as one of your toolbars essentially from a cost perspective, uh, but I would just keep in mind that there are some reasons that you probably would want to consider components elsewhere. 
great. Thank you, Peyton. A uh, question from Doug. Does the Aero Indiegogo uh, online mutual NDA cover non-compete uh, clauses? So from the Indiegogo side, I would say that um, you know if you run a campaign on another platform, um, then the option that is available to you on Indiegogo is the in-demand option. Um, Keaton, do you want to talk about from the Arrow perspective um, in terms of any not compete clauses? Yeah. So um, you know, from the from the Arrow perspective, in terms of non compete, uh, essentially most of the time what we've looked at here is um, in terms of a company's IP versus your IP. Um, when we're looking at this, we're treating you as an individual for an entrepreneur. So um, when you're applying for that, if you have your own company and that kind of thing, we're treating that all as associated with you as a campaigner. So um, just you know, from my perspective, most of the time when I've seen it, we haven't had any issues uh, with people in terms of IPs of different companies. But um, definitely make sure that what the product you're using is your own. Um, but from that perspective, I don't see anything that we've had any issues with. Great. Um, let's see, so next question from Lorenzo. To be eligible for AeroFlash funding, is there a minimum amount of components that have to come from the Aero catalog? Um, what are the requirements otherwise? Um, I can tackle some of the basics of this. Uh, so in order to be eligible for AeroFlash funding, um, one of the main requirements is you must have a live Indiegogo campaign. Um, you, uh, your technology of your product must have achieved Aero certification. Um, and also, you must be in a specific uh, list of countries, so US, Canada, and a select number of European countries, um, including the UK um, and elsewhere, uh, campaigners are eligible in those countries to win um, to uh, for flash funding opportunity. So for all the specific lists of terms and conditions, you're welcome to check out our um, Aero uh, program page. The terms and conditions are posted there. There is no requirement um, in terms of you know buying components or having components available uh, from Aero. But Keaton, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I'd want to add to that is there's no minimum component count associated with this. Um, so if you have a small bomb that's just a few parts, but it's a really great idea, uh, there's no punishment or penalty for it. The, the whole idea here is just to be able to uh, work with you to ensure that the components that you have on there and that you've selected are the best ones that you're going to want to work with. Um, but there's no component count requirement. There's no um, minimum associated with that. Uh, just kind of as you're keeping that in mind, it, it's just purely um, just getting arrow, uh, your technology arrow certified. Great. Um, we've got another question from Alice. Uh, this is a great question for you, Gain. Can arrow help to find a compatible part? The concern is not only price, but the module's dimension. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's our bread and butter in many ways. We have a ton of different suppliers that are associated with our line card. Um, and we also have just experts across the board. We have many tools that we can utilize that you may not have available to you um, from either a crossing selection or just a parametric selection um, of components. So if it's something that you're having a hard time finding, it, you need a smaller module, you need a cheaper module, you need uh, you want to actually go with a chip down design and you want to look at all the components associated with it, Arrow can definitely help with every step of that and give you, honestly, multiple options. It may not just be something where you just want a single part. You're probably going to want a few things to evaluate and see just how easy the technology is to use. Great. Um, we have some more questions about IP and like confidentiality and security. So uh, Doug asks, is there a secure site to transfer confidential documents to and from Arrow besides using email? Yeah, we do have ways that we can go through and, and help you set up a secure site to ensure that those documents are being passed. Um, it's not, you know, we obviously, most of our customers will engage via email um, just based on the fact that when we're looking at this, it's more of a high level um, for the first initial review. So we don't typically try to make sure, make you go immediately into all of your bread and butter or your secret sauce. That's not the goal. If it is something that you want to try to do a production route, Arrow has those options and then we'll need the design files. But we can absolutely make sure that there's a secure file transfer point um, that your products can go through and your files can go through. Uh, and we typically have you work with our uh, certification rep to go through and make sure that the files are handled in a way that you feel comfortable and secure with um, and that it's only a one-to-one -one transfer. Um, there's no concerns about it going up publicly. Great. So we have a question from Rick here. So uh, Rick wants to create a tiny wearable device, but the miniaturization process will affect every aspect of the design and will preclude almost any off-the-shelf parts. So how can Arrow help in these kinds of situations where the parts are not off-the-shelf? 
Yeah, so um, so in terms of kind of covering off the shelf, so typically what we're referring to there, if you're talking about it being um, too small or you need the wearable to be too small, is you can't use like module-based solutions. You're probably gonna have to go with something chip down related in order to make it work. Um, so with that, what I would typically want to look at is can we find a part that's going to fit your design? So the first thing that I would go through if I was doing that review is say, can we talk about what the size associated with your product is going to be and what the minimum functionality requirements are? Uh, once we've kind of gone through that, we'll start to look at from a sizing perspective, what components would be available to be able to uh, purchase such that you could utilize them in your design? So if, for example, your wearable needed Bluetooth, there are some modules that are, or excuse me, there are some components that are incredibly small that you could be able to potentially work with. Um, and typically those will have designs associated with them, or we can get you connected with the right rep associated with that line if it's something that it's beyond the support point that uh, you're able to cover yourself on the data sheet. So it's something we do have available. Um, I would highly recommend if it's something you don't know, if there's components available that will fit that size or you're not sure about from a chip down perspective, what will that look like? There's no modules or costs that you're be able to build with it. Um, talk with us. We will definitely be able to provide you feedback on the correct direction to go there. Um, we've seen it time and time over. And if you have anything that needs to be super small from a wearable perspective, we're happy to kind of be assisting in that process. Uh, IoT is one of our areas of expertise. Awesome, thank you, Keaton. Um, another question, uh, what precautions do you recommend for uh, protecting the firmware IP of a microcontroller-based design? So maybe sure. in the process of what, you know, how you handle these kinds of IP questions, protecting your IP questions. Yeah, so in that, um, in that example in particular, <laughs> that's a fascinating question, it's very technical, but to go through the particulars of it, what I would typically recommend is that you have a crypto authentication chip associated with your design. So in a lot of cases, these crypto authentication chips, um, unfortunately, will, will have, excuse me, fortunately will have a piece of their uh, design that enables that if it's open or cracked open as someone's trying to probe it, it will actually erase all of the um, firmware associated with the product so that no one's able to get to it. And there's a couple of companies that make those at varying levels of crypto authentication security. Um, but it's something that if you haven't, if you need to protect it, and it's something that it's very important that the firmware on your product is maintained that way, I highly recommend looking at those products. Um, I've actually seen one demoed. It's pretty impressive to see all the things that you can do with it. Um, and it just adds another additional layer of security that you may not have had before just from a software-based encryption system. Great. Um, Alice asks, you know, who should she contact about uh, the component search? So I'm just going to move back to this slide here. Um, uh, you're welcome to uh, join the error certification at this URL here. Um, you can also send some questions to indiegogo at arrow.com. Um, and, and, you know, questions there do get uh, to Keaton. So, um, yeah. Uh, next question, uh, is this service error certification program for U.S. citizens only or is it available to non-U.S. citizens? So it, uh, actually, eligibility really has nothing to do with your citizenship, but um, it is available to anyone uh, around the world. There are certain benefits, uh, such as flash funding opportunities, that are restricted um, due to legal reasons in certain countries. But uh, in terms of the general benefits, um, anyone, it, you know, there is no geographic restriction. Anyone can join the Air Certification Program. All right, um, next up, we have someone who's applied for their certification program um, and you know hasn't re received a response regarding the bill of materials. Uh, we're happy to follow up with you again. Um, if for any reason you haven't received a response, um, you know, feel free to follow up to the indiegogo at arrow.com email address. Um, but we will also follow up after this webinar. And we have people on the webinar as well who are associated with the program. So we've been monitoring those. If there was a, an example of that, we'll definitely make sure that we're working to reach back out. Great. So, all right. So Lorenzo asks, if I sign with a contract manufacturer who wasn't proposed by Arrow to make a prototype, samples, et cetera, can I still work with Arrow in parallel? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, the whole goal here is your success. So if you end up going with a contract manufacturer just based on you had a, another selection you want to go with, that's no big deal. I mean, obviously, I'm going to hope that you want to buy the parts from Arrow. We have a lot of really good things associated with it. But if your contract manufacturer used someone else, uh, the goal of this program is not to be limiting or gating in any way. 
Um, we want to make sure that your product is reaching a reality, so we're happy to work with you. We want to make sure you're getting through the design process. Um, and then as you're going along, we would be happy to compete from a contract manufacturer perspective, be able to let you see what our prices are like um, so that you have those options available for you. Uh, but if it's something you end up going with someone else, not a problem at all. We're happy to work with you. Okay, so uh, great. And Doug asks, if my product receives an award and uh, error design and development resources are necessary, does the award include those services or only funding from Indiegogo? So I think Doug, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this question is asking whether um, the prize is uh, flash funding, you know, cash or in-kind services, uh, which are also uh, part of the flash funding program. Um, that would be communicated uh, to you uh, if you receive the award. Um, it can be any combination or either one, of, um, one or the other. So, Doug, if we have your correct, uh, question incorrect, please let us know in the chat. Another question, uh, uh, do you outsource the engineering when the designs are really complex? Um, so essentially, we're, we're going to make sure that when we're working with you, um, we're preparing you as best as we can to get your product ready to go. If it's something where the design services are past the point where you're going to be able to handle, uh, we do have design service partners that we can work with to be able to ensure that you're getting it done. Um, it's not something that we I would not be necessarily directly taking on your design from that perspective. Typically, what we'll try to do is recommend if there's a route that you can avoid that um, or is available for you, we're going to try to get you to that point. But if it's something that you need to end up outsourcing your design, we can help make recommendations to partners that we trust um, and that we know will be able to get the product done and potentially have specialty in the area of your product. So um, it is something that if it's past a certain level of complexity for you, uh, we'll definitely be able to give you recommendations either in terms of what you might want to try to staff um, or if you should be looking at a third party to help you out. Great. All right. Well, I think that uh, we are just about uh, have finished off with the questions. So I just wanted to leave everyone with one slide here, the additional resources, um, including the prototyping guide, which we will also send out in our post webinar recap email. Um, but I believe we're done. So thank you so much, Keaton. And thank you, everybody, for uh, attending our prototyping 101 webinar. See you next time. Thanks, everyone.